Hello and welcome to Physics Chat. Physics Chat is a show where we talk to real life researchers at the forefront of their research and learn more about what it's like to be a modern day physicist. My name's Susanna and I'm back with my amazing co-hosts, Sergi and Fox. It's great to see you both. You may recognise Fox if you follow us on Instagram. He's normally working behind the scenes, making sure everything in the field of view team is running smoothly. But today he's making his physics chat debut and joins us on the hosting panel. So how are you doing, Fox? Yeah, I'm great. Thanks. Um, How about you? I'm doing great, thanks. And I'm really looking forward to chatting with our next guest, Dr. Andrew Lundgren, otherwise known as Andy. Andy is an associate professor and researcher at the University of Portsmouth. And even though his background is in theoretical general relativity, he now leads the gravitational wave group at the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation. In other words, he is a legend. Anyway, it is such an honour and privilege to have you on Physics Chat, Andy. So how are you doing? Thanks, I'm doing well. It's nice to be here. Brilliant. So Andy, could you briefly tell us about your path into physics and the different places where you've been? I think it all started reading Stephen Hawking's book when I was a kid. Somehow I decided I wanted to go to MIT in, I think, in third grade. And then I did, studied physics there. Then I went to Cornell University in um, New York State for uh, graduate school. That's where I studied theoretical gravity. And then pretty much all of the jobs in gravity were in LIGO, um, in gravitational waves. So when I graduated, I went to Syracuse University to start uh, doing LIGO research then Penn State, and then uh, the Albert Einstein Institute in Hanover, Germany, um, where I was before this job for a couple of years. Wow, that's that's really interesting. So I, I heard that you were the second person um, on Earth to observe the first gravitational waves that we ever detected. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, how that happened? Sure. It was in 2015. I was uh, in Hanover, the Albert Einstein Institute. And in fact, it was something like 10 days before the start of LIGO's first observing run, uh, the first time we were really going to turn it on and expect to maybe see something. So on Friday, I had been trying to figure out why our hardware injection system was failing. So what that means is in order to test everything end to end to be sure that we actually know what we're doing, uh, we put in fake gravitational waves. Um, We very well know that they're fake, but they look real. Come Monday around lunchtime, Marco Drago, who's a, a postdoc at the AI who worked on the burst search, uh, came running into my office and said that we'd seen a black hole, a merger of two black holes um, that the the computer had picked up automatically because the detector was running. Uh, it just wasn't quite, you know, it was working, just not quite ready for the observing run yet. Um, and so we spent some time figuring out that it wasn't a harbor injection and that this this the detector was working properly and you know this was not just an accident this was not just uh, a mistake it really looked like a real thing and then we emailed everyone the collaboration because no one was awake yet and uh, before the run no one has anyone's phone number uh, and then we called the sites to let them know uh, and they said you know nothing's happening on the sites no one's there's no one doing injections here everyone's asleep because it's midnight here and then gradually everyone woke up and a few hours later yeah we we heard that Yeah, it definitely was not an injection. No one was messing with the instrument. And this was probably the first detection of gravitational waves. Did you get to celebrate it after? We didn't celebrate for another six months. Uh, Okay. Until uh, it was official or? Yeah. So what we had to do is we had to to check absolutely everything because, like I said, it was four days before the run. So things weren't really in a frozen configuration. They froze them. we, We had to run the detectors for longer. We had to write the papers. We had to check everything so carefully. Uh, and then, yeah, we uh, we did the announcement. And yeah, we got champagne um, and we had a, a press conference, which was mostly in German. I had to answer questions in German about how, uh, uh, how I felt about this first detection. And then we had to submit the papers. So I remember submitting the papers to the archive with a glass of champagne in my hand over the laptop and then going back to the party. So just to recap for the audience, what what you thought was um, a, a fake gravitational wave uh, that was meant to test the detector was actually the first uh, ever gravitational wave detection that we had on Earth. Yeah, maybe I can tell a funny story about yeah. that. Because when we called the site, um, so there's an operator at the site. Um, and actually, this is one thing that I really want to say that 
there's a thousand people plus in LIGO. So there's so many people, everyone has a role to play. Um, the, the operators are, are the ones actually sitting in the chair for eight hours, washing the detector, making sure nothing goes wrong. We called them, let them know. And then they sort of started to spread the word. There were two people from the UK, actually, Sheila Rowan, two very important people, Sheila Rowan and um, uh, Sathya, we call him, uh, at Cardiff. And so I just popped into their meeting and said, we saw the injection. It's it's okay. We we, we know that uh, that you put in a black hole, and they had no idea what I was talking about. Um, so I, I accused basically the two most important people in the UK of uh, of doing this injection, and they they didn't know what I was talking about. So that's when I started to realize, oh, maybe this is actually a real thing. So it's time for my random question: If you could be a character in a movie, book, or film, what would you be, and why? I have to go with Star Trek: The Next Generation. Probably the chief engineer or science officer. It doesn't really seem to matter. They, they all do each other's jobs. But that's one of my favorite science fictions because it's a hopeful future for humanity where people actually work together and explore space. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, as you know, I am also a massive Star Trek and sci-fi fan in general. Um, I would probably agree with you on that placement, um, although I'd definitely be a science officer. So what is your favorite sci-fi paradox or philosophical conundrum? So I guess my favorite paradox, is it's not quite a paradox. It's just a very funny thing about gravity, which is that in a way, gravity doesn't really exist. And I can prove it to you by sort of enclosing you in an elevator and cutting the cable, sorry. Um, so if you go into free fall and you can't see anything outside, then gravity effectively doesn't exist. It's it's what you get when you're in orbit. So gravity is there, but you're free falling with the gravitational field. So it effectively has no, uh, doesn't do anything to you. And the only way to see that gravity exists is by taking things that are separated um, and they'll both fall like towards the center or they'll be stretched. Um, that's the tidal force. Um, what that means is that at a point, you can't define energy of the gravitational field. You can't do things like entropy or any of the other fancy things that we use. Um, that's very different from, say, electromagnetism. If I have a capacitor that's charged, I can just measure the electric field and tell you how much energy is in it. Whereas to get the energy of the gravitational field or the energy emitted by gravitational waves, I have to be very, very careful about what I mean. And I have to use all sorts of tricks and definitions. Um, and it's sort of unsatisfying. It feels like we don't quite understand what the theory is trying to tell us yet because all the advanced things that you learn in physics, like doing using energy and thermodynamics to solve problems, don't just work straightforwardly. You have to be very tricky about it. Wow, that was um, an excellent choice because mm -hmm. actually what we wanted to talk to you about was um, general relativity. So as you mentioned, general relativity or GR for short um, is our best um, current theory explaining gravity. Uh, it was proposed more than 100 years ago by Einstein. And you've been working on, on several aspects of this theory for a long time now. So my first question to you would be, if you had to explain the main big idea behind this theory in, say, one minute, what would you say? The main idea about general relativity is that gravity is not really a force. It's all about the curvature of space-time. So what space-time is, I mean, you're familiar with space, there's three different directions you can go, and time. Um, and in the theory of special relativity, you sort of see that these are aspects of the same thing. You don't notice this when you're not moving very fast relative to the speed of light. But if you start to go fast, then time and space get a little bit sort of interconnected. And then the general theory of relativity is about how that can actually curve. And so massive things like the sun or a black hole will curve space time. And that curvature of space time is what actually makes things fall. Um, really, what is happening is it's making clocks run at different rates. Um, so close to a massive object, clocks run slower and things want to follow the path of least time. And so they'll curve towards where the clocks are running slower. Uh, in a sense, they're just going as straight as they possibly can in this curved space time. And we just see it as them falling towards massive things. So that's, that's drastically different to what we learn in school. In, in school, we learn, um, that gravity is a force, um, and that's the, the Newtonian theory of gravity, right? Um, and there is space, just like you said, the three dimensions, 
Uh, but time is something completely different and it is the same for everyone. Um, there is one time for all the universe, right? And there is no talk about curvature. So what makes GR um, a better theory of gravity than, than this Newtonian theory? I guess it's important to say that your physics teachers aren't lying to you. Um, the Newtonian gravity works perfectly fine in most situations that you need it. Space and time work perfectly well unless you're going close to the speed of light. So GR doesn't replace Newtonian gravity, it kind of subsumes it. It is the same in the situations where Newtonian gravity is meant to work. But when things become very compact, when you take, uh, say, the mass of the Earth and compact it down into a black hole, it would be about a centimeter in size compared to how big it is um, right now, 6,000 kilometers or whatever. So you can get much closer to all that gravity. And that's when general relativity starts to take over. And it just predicts things much more accurately when the gravitational field is very strong um, or when things are going very fast relative to the speed of light. So what are some of these things that GR has helped us discover about the universe? So one of the sort of unexpected applications is actually the global positioning system. So global positioning works by, uh, or GPS, works by satellites in orbit with very accurate clocks. And because you're basically timing how fast the clock is going very accurately, because it's in orbit far away from the gravity of the Earth, the clock runs a little bit faster than it does here on Earth. And so you have to account for that or else the GPS would be off by 10 or 20 meters. So that's one practical example. And then there's just the prediction of things like black holes, which now um, we're pretty sure that we've detected. Yeah, those are excellent examples. There is another one, which is your field of expertise, uh, and that's gravitational waves. Um, so could you explain us how general relativity connects with gravitational waves? Gravitational waves are one of the predictions of general relativity. Uh, it happens when you get massive objects moving around each other and accelerating. One of the funny facts about astrophysics is that most star systems aren't like ours with just one sun. They're more like Tatooine um, with two suns. Uh, so a lot of star systems are in binaries. And as the stars go around each other, uh, they create gravitational waves, um, which are ripples in space-time, which actually do carry away energy from the system. And you know, orbits are sort of powered by energy. If you take energy out of an orbit, it makes the orbit tighter. It makes it go faster, closer and faster, which actually makes the gravitational waves stronger. Binary star systems, systems will actually in-spiral into each other and then merge. Um, yes, that was really uh, interesting, um, how you can drive uh, gravitational waves from GR. Um, so why do you think the gravitational waves are so interesting in the first place? Because they're such a clean test of physics and a clean test of general relativity. What I mean by that is that a lot of things that you want to study in physics, uh, you need to know so many little parts of physics and do so many detailed calculations that aren't really part of the answer that you're trying to get. Gravitational waves come from very simple systems, two extremely compact objects, um, and it's just basically gravity. There's no other physics that's really required. And so once you do that, you get a very good test of what gravity does uh, in very, very, you know, when you're pushing it to the absolute limits in very, very strong fields. Uh, and so if there's something funny about that theory, if there's something beyond general relativity in the same way that general relativity is beyond Newtonian gravity, it's a very strong test of that. And that's the way that we can learn where general relativity doesn't explain things anymore. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. What are you most looking forward to in the coming years um, in terms of gravitational waves? So I'll do a little plug for the next science run of uh, LIGO. Um, we call it 04, the, the fourth observing run. We're going from maybe seeing one thing every couple months to now seeing maybe a merger a day, hopefully even more. Uh, so we're going from just proving the gravitational waves exist to really understanding um, everything that creates them. But in 2035, uh, we're planning to launch the LISA satellite, and you need to uh, need to keep after the politicians and the people with the money uh, to make sure this happens. LISA is LIGO in space. Um, so in it's a couple million kilometers uh, between these spacecraft rather than the four kilometers uh, that LIGO is it will see um, much more massive black holes. It will see, instead of these little ones that are only 30 times the mass of the sun, 
um, it will see things that are millions and billions uh, of solar masses, the things that the kind of black holes that are the centers of galaxies. And what that will tell us about, because if you look at the center of our galaxy, we've got uh, a couple million uh, solar mass black hole. And where did it come from? What? How did the galaxy assemble and how did the black hole evolve? Um, Lisa will go back in time and see, not go back in time, it will look back in time, I should say, uh, and see how these sort of things form, see how see what happens when galaxies merge and the black holes merge and tell us essentially you know where the big galaxies today came from um, and you know the, the history of of the entire universe essentially. Well, I'm looking forward to Lisa and the results that are coming, for hopefully, from that. That sounds super interesting. Thank you so much for being on Physics Chat. It was so interesting talking to you about the mind-blowing theory of general relativity. And hopefully, we gave you a flavour into some of the weird things we observe. Who knew that time changes depending on where you are in the universe? It kind of reminds me of the fact that time goes very slowly when I'm stuck in a boring lecture or lesson, but very fast when I'm chilling out with my friends. Anyway, thank you for joining us and let us know in the comments section if you could be a character in a movie, book or film, what would you be and why? We'd love to hear from you. But for now, from everyone at Field of View, we hope you have an amazing day and goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> They're all muted. I knew it would happen. They're all muted. muted. Yes. Unmute. Ah. In a way, gravity doesn't really exist.